our C toolkit. This is a programming course, after all, and all the exercises, uh, assignments, um, labs, everything will be programming in C. When I talk about this, there is a baseline assumption that you have experience with a C-like language, if not C itself, something like C++, Java, C Sharp, something along those lines. The purpose of this course is really not to teach you how to program in C, but my past experience from teaching other courses suggests that it is helpful if we go over a number of important concepts and conventions in C programming that really helps everybody to get on the same page, but also streamlines explanation of future code examples. So it's desirable, I think, to put all these things together in the same place for quick reference, uh, and it will hopefully be useful to you in that regard. Now, when I say that uh, there is a baseline assumption about a previous uh, experience in some C-like language. It means we're not going to talk about how an if statement works or a for loop or, or anything like that. Uh, that's something that I expect that you know. Uh, but we'll talk about C conventions and differences between C and C++ that are somehow noteworthy. So let's get started. C is a procedural language. That is to say it has functions, that doesn't make it a functional programming language, there is a different definition of functional programming language, but it is procedural, there are procedures which we normally call functions. Uh, it is not an object-oriented language, it is not anything like an object-oriented language. There are no objects, there are no interfaces, there's no inheritance, there's no class hierarchy, there's no classes, there's nothing like that. You might actually find that to be kind of liberating when it gets down to it, uh, although you might also find this to be strange and confusing in some sort of wild, wild west. Nevertheless, um, we work a lot with functions, uh, and functions work as they do in all C-like languages. Uh, they have a return type, a function name, and a list of arguments that will uh, work as you would expect. Uh, and they have a body, and you know, the body has to be an implementation of that function. Okay, in terms of actually working with the language, uh, I'm mostly in, in the uh, course of this uh, going to use Vim. You don't have to use it, you can use whatever editor you like, you probably would prefer something that is a little bit more user-friendly, something that is a little bit more uh, UI heavy. Uh, I've had some positive experiences with things like Notepad++, um, C-Lion, uh, in particular if you're a student you can get a student license for C-Lion. Uh, without having to pay for it, otherwise it would be a paid product. Uh, and you can use those for most of the code that we're going to write in this course. It is fairly small. You know, this, uh, this example uh, that we're looking at you know, fits all in one file. It only has a few functions, so just doing it with a text editor that has some syntax highlighting is sufficient. In a real-world scenario where we are talking about a much more complex program with many more lines, then obviously maybe you want to use something a little bit more advanced uh, for that scenario. But we'll get started. So I've just defined a scratch pad file. We're not really going to try to compile it. We're just going to uh, actually get started with uh, writing some code and give you an idea. So I mentioned that um, C has functions, and functions work as you would expect. So if I declare a function here, int function name, you will see. Obviously, you should give parameters better names than arg1, arg2, arg3. And it has to have a function body and that is the definition of a function. This one is called function name. It has a return type of int. It takes three parameters. First one is double, second is integer, third one is character. Uh, and that is exactly as we would expect. Um, header files are uh, imported into the program using a precompiler directive. Uh, and that's what it means. Uh, this uh, number sign, hashtag, pound, whatever you want to call it, is a precompiler directive directing the compiler to actually take a certain action. In this case, it is we want to include, say, standard IO header. Uh, unlike in C++, you actually specify the .h uh, in that version. So for any of the standard headers, it appears in angle brackets. If we were including our own file, 
uh, such as custom.h, then we would include it in quotation marks as opposed to angle brackets. Uh, and many of the functions that we wish to call, particularly in the systems programming part, are defined in these header files. There are a lot of um, a lot of functions that are defined here. So if you're trying to use a library function, the compiler says it doesn't know what you mean. There's a, a brief checklist of what you can try. Number one is make sure you spelled the name correctly. You know, it's easy to make a typing mistake uh, in a function name, especially uh, if if you're looking at one of those system call functions where the name is short. You know, it's five characters and they're all consonants. You know, it's not a full word. Uh, that, that could be easy to mistype. Uh, second thing to check uh, is that you got the number of parameters correct. Uh, sometimes you, you only put two parameters and there should be three, or you put an extra one where it doesn't belong. Uh, and then you should also check that you have included the correct header file. The man pages will frequently specify in what uh, header file a particular function is defined. If the compiler gives you a warning about implicit declaration of a function, it means that a header is missing, but the compiler can guess about what you want. You should still fix that by including the correct header file, uh, which you might have to Google. Uh, in any case, you will find it, and including it gets rid of the warning. Uh, and although the warning doesn't stop your program from being compiled, it's better if you don't just leave the warning hanging there, because uh, it messes up your output and uh, takes attention away from actual issues that might really be a problem. Okay, one of the other things uh, while we're on the subject of includes is that by default the C language has no Boolean type. Uh, and for that, there is a header standard bool.h, which you would have to include for a boolean. In many contexts, an integer is just used where zero represents false and one represents true, or actually any non-zero value represents true. Um, but if you include the standard bool header, it provides you the type as well as explicit values for the keywords true and false. And that might seem silly, but that is a problem that people sometimes kind of stumble across. Okay, speaking of uh, the compiler perhaps not knowing how to find a function, imagine we have something like this. We have function foo, uh, which calls function bar. And they have a fairly simple definition. Like this. Now, when you try to compile it, the compiler will tell you that uh, the compiling of function foo, it can't find function bar. What gives? It's right there. You just have to look a tiny bit further and you will find it. Some of the rules of the C compiler date back to the original design of the language. And in those ancient and primitive times, the compiler was unwilling to take two passes of compiling the source code because it would simply take too long. Obviously, in more modern programming languages, these sorts of things don't matter. The compiler is perfectly fine with taking two passes at it. It can scan the whole file and find all the functions and figure out what to do. Um, in C, this is not the case, uh, and that can occasionally be a little bit strange, but it's the rules and we have to live with them. Okay, so there's two possible solutions to that. One is you can move the function bar above function foo, so at the time when bar is called, uh, by foo, it's our, the compiler has already seen the definition, it already knows that it exists, and it knows how to invoke this function. The other thing that you could do is write a function prototype. Uh, and a function prototype is declared usually uh, towards the top of the file, if not in header files themselves, if you're writing your own header file, in which you give a definition of the function bar. So int bar, and then int v1, int v2. Uh, these are um, these are necessary for the compiler to have an understanding that there will at some point exist a function that conforms to this signature. So when the compiler is compiling the file, it sees, okay, there will exist a function bar uh, that has two parameters, first is an int, second is an int. When it gets to compiling foo, it sees bar with arguments of two integers, and it says, okay, I recognize that this corresponds to the promised function bar, so I'm going to 
uh, accept that and I will be able to complete the definition of that later uh, and when it gets to the function bar the promise is fulfilled uh, and the compiler is able to make that happen. Uh, this allows compilation to succeed uh, because we've told the compiler what to expect even though it hasn't, uh, hasn't actually found it yet until it gets to the end of the file. Okay, so that will allow compilation to succeed. Uh, in another ancient rule based on uh, the idea of no second passes, uh, before the C99 standard, a statement like this was not permitted. Uh, we'll uh, fill in a body for it at some point later. Uh, why was this not allowed? Well. In, in the original code, um, C required you to declare all local variables in that function at the beginning of the function. So what you would actually do is write int i up here, uh, and at the beginning of the for loop, you would assign i equals zero, i less than 10, i plus plus. All right, the idea on that was that the compiler would need to know how much space to allocate on the stack for this particular function. Uh, and how much space to allocate on the stack depends on how many stack variables that there are. Uh, and something like int i as declared here is a stack variable. Uh, and so to make the compiler's job easier, some of the work was pushed off uh, onto the programmer by having to declare all of those variables up at the top of the function. And you couldn't just declare them anywhere you wanted and you couldn't declare them you know, in a for loop construct. Now, we will always assume at least the C99 standard, so this problem is avoided. Uh, it is perfectly okay if you compile with the C99 or above option to declare integers anywhere you want, declare variables anywhere in a function, and that's fine. However, if you come across some example code or you see uh, some uh, some other code somewhere that has all the variables declared up at the top and a wire int i, j, and k for the for loops all declared at the beginning of, of the function. That's why. So that's something that uh, you can watch out for if, if you see it. Uh, in C, officially, all comments uh, are written using the slash star uh, to open and then star slash to close syntax. Uh, the C++ style of comment, like you know, double slash comment, is not officially supported. It may be permitted by your compiler, but it's not necessarily accepted everywhere. So my recommendation is that you should write C style comments. C style comments can, of course, be multi-line. You can make them as long as you want. The compiler uh, will consider the comment to start from the slash star and then end at the star slash. Uh, and that is uh, something that we just can use anywhere and for as big of a block as you would like. Okay, on to structures. Now, perhaps the most striking difference in C for those whose only programming experience up till now is object-oriented programming is that C has no such concept, no classes, no hierarchy, no interfaces, no abstract classes, none of that. There's no access control modifiers, you know, there's no public, private, protected, any of those things. There do still exist programmer-defined types. Uh, and the programmer defined type is the structure, and the keyword for that is struct. Uh, a structure is a forerunner of the class. You know, if, if you think of the class as being the uh, evolution of a struct, that's actually kind of accurate. Uh, a structure, however, is just a group of variables. Um, and you define a structure by saying what are its contents, and that's all there is. There's no member functions, there's no constructors, there's no destructors, there's none of that. All there is is a structure, uh, and a structure is a grouping of whatever you tell it to be. Okay, so if we're going to define a point, let's say in three-dimensional space, uh, then we can define our type here, struct point. Uh, and it will have x coordinate, y coordinate, and z coordinate, uh, all of which are of type double. And we have defined a very simple structure that has x, y, and z. Now, of course, there's no rule that says all elements uh, of the structure have to be the same type. They could actually be anything. Uh, in this case, it just makes sense for the example that the point uh, is coordinates, and it has x, y, and z components, and you can name the components, whatever you would like. Now, uh, when you want to actually use this, well, uh, we will 
create a struct. So struct point P1. Struct point uh, is in this case the type. Uh, and so it's as if we said int i, just struct point is the type, and then p1 is the name of the variable, uh, and we use the dot operator to then assign values uh, or read values if we wish. So that should be negative 2.5 uh, and p1. Okay. Uh, also noteworthy, uh, while, while I think of it, is when we declare a variable uh, here in, in C, uh, in I is not defined in anything. It contains garbage at the moment. Uh, the variable has to be initialized to have a value. Uh, and the same is true when we declare a struct point P1. Uh, the variable is stack allocated uh, in this case, and it contains garbage until you explicitly assign it to have some values. Now, one of the things that you might find frustrating with a... Uh, with a struct is you end up with a construct that looks like this. So we're going to define a function, you know, add points, and uh, we, we will do something like this. And you can imagine return result. Okay. So we have to type the word struct a lot, a lot of times. That's somewhat unpleasant because you know, it's a lot of unnecessary typing. Um, we can save ourselves a fair amount of trouble with that with another keyword, and that keyword is type def. Type def says I want to define a new type. So we'll use type def struct point, uh, and then we can give our new type a name. Uh, and in some cases, you will see you know, this point underscore t kind of convention uh, as a form of how you would um, how you would name a programmer defined type. That's actually no longer recommended uh, in various style guides. You will, of course, come across uh, a number of those uh, underscore t types uh, as you go through code. Um, but if you're defining your own type, it is no longer recommended. You can. The Unix police are not going to like burst into your home and arrest you if you do. Uh, and it's not as though uh, a marker who is evaluating uh, an assignment is going to say, oh, you use underscore t on the name, unacceptable. Uh, that wouldn't happen. Uh, but style conventions are usually worth following. Um, okay, so when we've defined that, we can actually replace here uh, in our code all of the times that we wrote struct point with point underscore t. Uh, and you can imagine this makes our code a little bit more compact uh, and is perhaps a little, a little bit easier to read. Uh, again, it's uh, it's not strictly necessary. You could do without this if you wanted, um, but you will find very frequently that there are programmer-defined types that have used the type def command. Um, so yeah, we uh, prefer to do this wherever we can, just because it reduces noise in your program. Um, you can, if you want, type def sort of anything that you want. Um, you can you know, type def something like um, type def int. Uh, as uh, PID type. Uh, so you could use a different type name for something that is really just at its heart an integer. You don't have to define a structure for this if you don't want. Uh, it allows you to use your own names for things if you wish, if you have a reason. The reason for that is usually along the lines of it makes it harder to make a mistake. Um, if there are a number of integer parameters uh, to your function, if you use type deft types for the specifics it makes it a little bit clearer what type is expected the value might be just a regular integer and you know, the storage on it might just be a regular integer and that's fine however you can be kind to somebody who wants to invoke this function you can be kind even to your future self in this regard um, by using the type def to give some more hints about the types of things that should actually happen um, you can 
Also, um, delete, if you want, the name of the thing after the struct here. Uh, if you make it type def struct, and then it's definition with the name point t, that is technically an anonymous struct, which we are then naming as point t, and it just saves you from that unnecessary, uh, unnecessary word, and it's exactly equivalent to the previous definition. Okay, the next big thing to consider in C is memory allocation, deallocation, and pointers. Uh, so we'll think about memory um, in a little bit of detail. Um, the, there are three kinds that are worth talking about. There's global memory, stack, and heap. So, okay, stack allocated memory is what is local to your function and it's currently running and it's automatically thrown away when the function returns. So within this function here, int i is declared as an integer inside this function called function name. It is stack allocated. It will be thrown away when this function returns and the same is true for struct point p1. Memory that is allocated on the heap is explicitly asked for and must be explicitly returned as well. Okay, um, we'll see how to do that. Um, again, if you're familiar with something like C++, and then you're familiar with the idea of allocating and deallocating memory, uh, in a language like Java, you might allocate memory, but have it garbage collected for you. C does not have, uh, have garbage collection. Um, one of the things that's worth remembering is that stack memory is somewhat limited. Uh, you can't put an endless amount of stuff in the stack. It is possible to run out of stack space uh, depending on how much data you want to have. Heap space is very large, not infinite, but it is dramatically larger than stack space. So if you have a large amount of data, if you have an array where you don't know what the size of it is going to be, you probably need to put that in heap space because there is a possibility that it's too large for stack space. In some programming languages, you can get away without knowing the difference between heap and stack, but this is C. The difference is important. You have to know it. It, it will matter in various situations. So. Uh, as previously mentioned, int i as declared here is a stack allocated variable and its lifetime is just as long as this function foo runs. It ceases to exist when this function gets to a return statement uh, and therefore you can't use it for anything anymore. Uh, when you return a value, you are in fact copying that value uh, as the return value, so that's okay. Um, it is important, as I already mentioned, to remember that when a variable is declared, it does not have an initial value. It has to be initialized, otherwise it contains garbage, and this is important and is a frequent source of error in programs. Uh, even students in uh, my fourth year class uh, with a great deal of programming experience occasionally forget to initialize variables, and then they end up spending quite a lot of time debugging their program, not entirely understanding why this isn't working the way they think it should, uh, or why the behavior is inconsistent. It's because you didn't uh, initialize that variable and it contains garbage, and if there's an if statement that depends on the value of it, who knows what happens. Okay, global variables. So if I declare a global variable here as something like this, uh, this is a global variable because it is defined outside of any function, uh, and uh, it's not really in any scope. This can be used for good. Um, excessive use of global variables is a warning sign of poor program design. Um, global variable space is also not infinite. Uh, you can put some stuff in global variables, but you should try to limit that as much as possible. Now, um, global variables appear more in the course than they would in a real program. Uh, sometimes this is just to make the example somewhat simpler. Uh, sometimes it is to make an exam question uh, something you can complete in the amount of time that the exam question should take. Um, and the program that we're writing is small, you know, it all fits uh, on one page uh, or one screen, uh, and it's not that important. But in real life, you usually try to avoid this sort of thing. It's usually better to not have a lot of global variables because your program design shouldn't depend on those. 
Now, global variables are usually initialized to zero uh, if you don't give them an explicit value, but it's best not to count on that behavior. You should be thinking um, in C, whenever a variable is declared, it has to be initialized somewhere. Now, it doesn't have to be initialized uh, statically, as is the case here. You know, the compiler will then initialize uh, char g equals this uh, at this stage, but you can also initialize global variables in, uh, in your program somewhere else. That's perfectly fine as well. But the real magic is in heap memory allocation, uh, and that is something that is easy to get wrong, and we'll see why that is the case. Okay. In C, heap memory is allocated in a very simple way. You just ask for the amount of memory that you want, and you ask using the number of bytes. Um, the function for this is malloc, uh, and it takes exactly one parameter, and that parameter is the number of bytes of memory that you want. So if you want to allocate an integer on the heap, you call malloc, uh, and you request how many bytes you actually need that correspond to an integer. And how many bytes is that? Now, you might have said four. That's not always the case. A quick look at the C standard says that some things have exact types. Character always has, like char, always has size one. Double, double precision, IEEE, floating point number has a size that's a eight, something like that. Integers, however, only have a minimum size. The rest is implementation specific. It can vary a lot from one system to another. Uh, and accordingly, you know, you might not know off the cuff what is the size of integer on the system that you are, uh, you are writing it. So what do we do? Well, there is fortunately the size of operator, uh, which asks the compiler to help us out here and substitute in the correct size when it is needed. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll say, al uh, allocate please size of int. Now, when the compiler is uh, preparing the code uh, to run on this machine, it will take a look and see, okay, what is the size of an integer on this system? Uh, and then it will, in fact, allocate that amount of memory by replacing size of int with the size on the system. Let's imagine that it is four. Uh, and then it will convert this malloc call automatically for you to be malloc of size four. Uh, and everything is going to work out. This is also very helpful if you want to allocate the memory corresponding to a struct. Uh, if I uh, allocate here size of point t, uh, it allocates the memory for that struct. And if I change the definition of the struct, uh, it will allocate the correct size. You don't have to work out the size of the struct based on its constituent components. You know, okay, well, a double I know is eight and there's three of them and I multiply them. Uh, and I have pe seen people do this on exam questions and I don't know why uh, they did not remember size of is a thing, uh, but you can save yourself all that extra manual math that could get out of date. Uh, if you added another parameter here, uh, you, you added a name to the point or, or you added a mass to the point, it could be, um, it could be then just updated without you having to do anything everywhere malloc size of point t occurs, um, then no problem. Um, now malloc returns a pointer uh, and it actually returns a void pointer, uh, which is say a pointer with no type. We're gonna talk about that soon, um, but okay. Uh, I will declare here int star x uh, is assigned the return value of this memory allocation. Okay, what happened uh, here? So I have declared on the stack, there is a pointer x. The value of that pointer is what is returned by malloc. Uh, when malloc is run, it allocates some memory on the heap. It allocates the number of bytes that we asked for, and it returns a pointer, uh, returns a value, the address of where that memory is found. Uh, and then we're assigning that value into the uh, in, into this integer pointer x. So the value contained in x is the uh, value telling us where the memory is. It's the address of the memory that was allocated. Uh, and malloc does not initialize the memory to anything. The value contained there is whatever garbage happened to be there uh, when the memory was assigned to our 
uh, program. So we have to remember to initialize that as well. Uh, and we initialize it uh, by dereferencing the pointer x. And we do star x is assigned 0. Uh, and this dereferences that pointer, says you know, follow the directions, go to the address uh, contained in pointer x. And when we get there, assign the value to be 0. Uh, and that would be a proper initialization of what we needed to do. Uh, now, as I mentioned previously, there's no garbage collection uh, in C or anything like it, uh, and therefore it is our responsibility to deallocate memory once we are finished with it. Uh, and this applies to anything that we have allocated using malloc. Uh, it is our responsibility to deallocate it. Uh, and the function for that is free, and free takes as its argument a pointer to the memory that you wish to deallocate. Okay. That is fairly straightforward. One of the things to watch out for, though, is that, uh, number one, free uh, should always be matched with malloc. So when you allocate memory, you should know where you no longer need it. Uh, number two, free doesn't specify the number of bytes that we are saying we are done with, um, because that means that the system has to remember uh, when I allocated memory here, how many uh, on the malloc statement, how many bytes that corresponds to, meaning it is not possible to return just part of the allocated memory. Uh, and number three, free just tells the system that we are done with this memory. Nothing actually happens to it. It doesn't go away. Uh, that's something that uh, could actually pose a problem a little bit later on because you might attempt to dereference the pointer x here after calling free. Uh, and just by good luck or bad luck, it might succeed uh, when you are testing it out on your machine and then it will you know, perform badly when someone is trying to mark your code or when a customer is trying to use it. So yeah, we should always remember to free that memory. If we fail to deallocate memory that we have allocated, this is a memory leak and it is a bad thing. That may not have immediate negative effects, but it's wrong. It is a programming error and it should be fixed. Uh, and in the long term, you know, if you do have a program that runs 24-7, you know, you know, this is a system that is supposed to run for as long as it's, you know, as long as it's needed, uh, this will eventually slow down the program and could eventually lead to a crash when the system runs out of memory. So every time you are allocating memory, you should think about where it's going to be deallocated. Uh, and uh, it is your responsibility to figure out where that is. Uh, it should be normally as soon as you know that the memory is no longer needed. If we're never going to do anything else with this again, then you should deallocate it right away. You don't have to wait around. The sooner you get rid of it, the better. Uh, but there definitely does have to be a path from allocation to deallocation uh, for, uh, for all of the memory, uh, and you always have to get to the deallocation. Now, um, reading the documentation of a function is sometimes necessary because that function might actually tell you that it allocates memory and returns to you a pointer to that memory that is then your responsibility to deallocate when you no longer need it. Uh, reading the documentation or the source code of a function will tell you if that is the case. Uh, and you can pass memory between many different functions within your program uh, as long as eventually whoever is the last to use it will deallocate it. In this example, uh, I've allocated memory and deallocated it in the same function, but it is, of course, perfectly valid for memory to be allocated here and allocate, uh, and it is returned and goes somewhere else and does something else and is only deallocated at the end. Um, when you deallocate memory with free, this needs to be done exactly once. Zero is wrong, and more than once is also wrong. Uh, if you try to call free on the same pointer twice, uh, it will very likely crash your program immediately. Uh, similarly, if you try to deallocate something that was allocated on the stack instead of the heap, that also very quickly uh, leads to a crash. So you do not want that. Uh, you should be mindful of what memory is, uh, is allocated on the stack, what memory is allocated on the heap, uh, and not try to deallocate something. Uh, by that same token, incidentally, if I declared like int star uh, y is assigned x here, this is a second pointer that is pointing to the same thing. Uh, 
The uh, assignment here does not allocate uh, more memory on the heap. We have a second stack allocated pointer, uh, and that is pointing to the same thing that x is pointing to. Uh, and uh, at this point, when we call free on x, it deallocates the memory that's being pointed to by x, and calling free on y is wrong. That would actually crash the program because we're saying to deallocate memory that has already been deallocated. Uh, and you can copy pointers like this if you wish. Uh, you just have to remember that this assignment statement does not allocate uh, more heap memory, and you can't uh, you can't free both x and y. Free of x is correct, or free of y is correct, not both. And remember that when you uh, copy pointers with something like this. Um, okay, um, one other thing worth noting, uh, when you use malloc in C++, if you used it before, the compiler insists that you cast the type, uh, doing something like um, uh, int star, casting the pointer return value of malloc to int star, and see it's unnecessary, uh, and in fact not recommended, so just don't do it. Okay. Uh, again, if you have previous C++ experience, you should be familiar with the idea of dereferencing pointers. Uh, that is, uh, this star x is assigned 0, we are dereferencing a pointer here. Follow the directions to the memory on the heap, uh, and that is fairly straightforward. Uh, if we have a function here, the you know, int work, which takes parameters, you know, int x, int y, and it returns x plus y, just for a, a very simple example, uh, and we want to invoke it, uh, then we will uh, int, uh, int star a is malloc size of int, int star b is malloc size of int as well, and star b is 7. Uh, and then we want to invoke work. We call work, uh, and because integers are expected, we call it with star a and star b. That dereferences it, it gets the value, and then submits, the, uh, submits those actual values. Uh, and then, of course, we have to free a and free b and ideally we do something useful with the return value of work which i had previously ignored okay suppose that the situation is reversed so we have um in in star x and in star y are parameters to work and we return the value of star x plus star y and do work actually has regular integers so let's do this instead and b is assigned 7 as work uh, okay we have regular integers and we need pointers and our solution for that, because A and B are stack allocated, is to use the address of operator. So we'll use address of A and address of B. What this does effectively is convert the type to what we need. We have regular integers that are allocated on the stack, uh, and we can feed the function work with a pointer to that stack allocated memory using the address of operator. Sometimes this is just convenient. Uh, it saves us from having to allocate a thing on the stack and then deallocate it later, uh, just to pass it into a function that is expecting pointers. We do have to use this with caution, though. Um, the stack allocated memory does not outlive the function it is allocated in, so when do work function ends, a and b go away, and any pointers to a and b that are outstanding are no longer valid. Uh, we'll use this in a number of examples uh, where we just st stack allocate something and then pass a pointer to it using the address of operator. However, you should be careful about it. Uh, if your program is not behaving as expected, you might end up with this sort of error. Um, I uh, recently helped somebody, uh, again in the fourth year course, debug a problem where things did not work as expected because a function ended and some variables went out of scope. Uh, and he didn't understand why it was the case. 
uh, because it seemed like everything should work fine, this is a problem. Okay. Uh, another thing uh, when we work with pointers uh, is the arrow operator, and it is somewhat of a nice notational shorthand that will really help us to um, avoid sort of unnecessary uh, decoration of our code. If we allocate a structure on the heap, like this point P here, which we have allocated, we need to initialize it uh, as we expect. Uh, and without the arrow operator, we have to do something like this. Star P1.x is assigned 99.9. .9. Okay, so parentheses, the dereferencing operator star, and the dot. This is the case because the dot operator has higher precedence than the um, than the dereference operator. The dot is higher in the order of precedence than the star, so we get evaluated first. And what we would actually attempt to do is do p1 dot x. Uh, if if we just did it without the parentheses, uh, it would it would be we'd try to do p1 dot x and then dereference it, and that doesn't work because p1 uh, I'm sorry should be p. Uh, is a pointer and it doesn't have an X property and that wouldn't happen. So we would have to do something like is shown here in parentheses star P dot X. That might seem unnecessary. Uh, an equivalent statement that has the exact same meaning and the exact same outcome is this. P1 and then the arrow operator formed by the little dash and the uh, right angle bracket. Uh, and it is exactly equivalent to the statement above, it just maybe looks a little bit nicer. Uh, if you really prefer one style, use that style. If the arrow operator makes no sense to you and it feels confusing and like you are just uh, going to get it wrong, that's fine. You can do the parentheses with the dereference operator and everything like that. Uh, and that is fine. It's not wrong to use either one of these. You can choose what you would like to do. Okay, uh, we will, of course, remember to deallocate this memory. Okay, now we're going to talk also about arrays. Arrays are somewhat simple uh, in C, and they can be either stack allocated or heap allocated, as you would expect. So if we want to declare a uh, stack allocated array, it's something like this int stack array and then in square brackets 10 that is the capacity of 10 integers remember of course this contains garbage uh, and it hasn't been initialized for a small array or for one that doesn't need to live very long uh, this could suffice it is much more likely that we actually want to allocate an array on the heap uh, and to do that we'll do int star uh, I'll call it heap array is malloc 10 times size of int. Okay, that looks weird. This is, this is, we asked for, could you please give me an amount of memory that is 10 times the size of integers, that is an array, a, a block of memory that is of sufficient capacity for 10 ints. That's our array. So integer pointers could point to only one integer, as is the case here at the start of the function here. In star x is malloc, we allocated it and it points to exactly one integer. Or it can point to an array of integers. In this case, I asked for an explicit size of 10. Um, yeah, so that might seem a little bit strange. You know, why is int star the, the type for an array? It is just a C thing uh, for it. Now. When you deallocate memory, incidentally, uh, in uh, in C++, if it's an array type, there is a difference when you use the delete operator. Not the case in in C. Free works exactly the same, no matter what you asked for. Uh, there's no difference when deallocating an array type. Now things aren't perhaps as dire uh, as you, you might fear. The things are like totally different, and I don't know what to do because you can still. Uh, access array elements using the square bracket notation as we do here. Uh, there's no difference uh, as to whether this is uh, heap or stack allocated uh, when we do it. And you end up just doing the same thing 
uh, in this case on two different array indices with two different values, but it works. The square brackets operator is clever enough to figure out whether this is a stack type or a heap type, uh, no matter what we are going to do. Uh, so that's fine. Now, the thing about the square brackets operator is it is effectively a calculation. So when you go to um, when you go to assign a value like this, what happens is uh, when you get to square brackets operator, okay, we go to stack array, yep, and then we calculate an offset using the number in the square brackets uh, times the size of the element in this array. Uh, and for that reason here, it's important to know what type uh, the array is. Otherwise, there's a, a difficult time uh, figuring out, the compiler has a difficult time figuring out what it is supposed to do. Um, and this means you can do bad things. You can put in negative one here uh, and the compiler won't object. It will do it. It will say, yeah, uh, I guess. Now, go to this, uh, go to stack array uh, and advance the uh, advance where we're looking at by negative one times the size of an integer so it actually goes backwards a bit uh, and then tries to assign the value there to be seven that might not actually work um, that might actually uh, crash your program because you're writing to memory that doesn't belong to you it would not be good but you can do it the compiler won't stop you by that same token you can very easily say oh go to array element 12 it will gladly let you try to read it you might actually read some garbage you might crash your program uh, if you're assigning a value you might overwrite some other memory or, or again crash your program uh, and usually uh, usually this will uh, just you know silently do something you didn't expect so that's not good. There's no automatic uh, array bounds checking. And that's something you should watch out for. Uh, similarly, array types don't have any sort of built-in properties. There's no way to know uh, just by looking at, you know, oh, in star array, what the capacity of that array is. For that reason, uh, when a function is called that is expecting uh, an array, uh, if we define a function here, uh, uh, initialize, array, I'll delete these two lines, uh, then you will usually pass in the array as well as its length to make it clear. Uh, so void initialize array to make it clear what is the type uh, of the array and what is the capacity. So usually again there is a second parameter that goes along with any array telling you the size of it. Okay when you want to initialize the array well I mean there, there is a very simple approach to do it uh, in i is assigned 0 i less than capacity i plus plus uh, and then you simply uh, assign the value so a at index i is assigned 0. Okay that's perfectly doable. This could potentially take a long time for a sufficiently large array, um, but there is actually a slightly better way to do this. Uh, and the way that I'm going to recommend that you do this, and you can do it for not just arrays, but you can use it to initialize structures, buffers, any, any amount of data that you want, is called memset. Memset is included in string.h, so I guess we'll uh, go up and add this here to the top. Uh, as we would normally do. Uh, and when you want to do this, we call memset. Uh, it is a normal function, and memset takes three parameters. It takes a pointer to the memory that you want to initialize. It takes an initial value, so zero in this case. We want to initialize uh, everything to be zeros. Uh, and then how many bytes we are going to, uh, how many bytes we are going to initialize. So in this case will be capacity times size of int. Now the thing about uh, initializing it is that it's very difficult to initialize to anything really other than zero. Uh, the function does an unsigned character conversion here. So uh, unless you really know a reason why, unless you really know what you're doing, I would just use this to initialize things to be zero. Uh, and as I said, you can do it for uh, any 
type. There's no reason why you have to do it only on an array. Um, so I could do the same thing here. Uh, delete this. I could do the same thing here for allocating uh, this point here, P. Uh, we're going to initialize it with zero and then size of point T. And then that sets all the fields in this structure to be zero. So that definitely comes with my recommendation. Memset is very useful for initializing memory to be zero uh, as, as we are uh, creating it. Uh, if you always remember to memset, you won't have problems with uninitialized variables. Okay, let's talk about strings. Uh, as far as C is concerned, a string is just a character array and is generally character pointer, char star. In C, a string is of arbitrary length and terminates with a zero byte. Um, this, this is one of those design decisions that I think people regret now because there are all kinds of problems that are caused where if you forget to, uh, if you forget to add a null terminator. So if we we'll declare a function here, Right. Uh, if we wanted to, we could uh, just declare our, uh, we haven't learned about printf yet, but we will soon, but you know, hello world here is, uh, is fairly standard. Uh, and in this case, we have a string literal. Uh, a string literal in this case is, uh, is just a string that we explicitly wrote, we didn't build it, we didn't programmatically compose it, we didn't read it in from a file, anything like that. And when you write it like this, the compiler graciously adds the null terminated for you. If you are composing a string, however, we have to remember to add this null terminator at the end. Uh, and the null terminator is an explicit zero. This is distinct from the from the number zero, uh, which as a character looks like this, uh, and that is you know just a number that you are printing out uh, for it. When you are composing a string, you know, suppose you're adding a bunch of strings together, you have to remember to add the null terminator at the end because like the printf function, for example, keeps going until it gets to a null terminator, and you could easily print some garbage if you didn't. Uh, remember the null terminator because it will just carry on. Uh, and you should also remember to make room for the null terminator when allocating memory or calculating how much you need for the length of a string. There do exist functions that will tell you what is the length of a string, um, but they might not count the null terminator. You have to read the documentation to be sure. Uh, and if you get that wrong, sometimes again, your function doesn't do what you expect it to do because you go wildly off the end of memory uh, that was allocated and you print some garbage or it crashes your program or something like that. So we do have to be a little bit careful with how we work with strings. There is a joke that says the history of C++ uh, and its evolution from C is the history of trying to improve string handling uh, in C, and there is some truth to this joke. Okay, uh, function convention. Now, there are no member functions for data objects or, or anything like that. So when we have a point here, you know, point T, uh, when we, want to have functions that manipulate it, the functions are defined separately. Uh, and I'll say something like this, you know, void add to point is a good example, uh, point t, t1, point t, t2. Uh, and this will follow a certain coding convention, usually, that the first parameter as provided is the one that is changed. Uh, and the same is true for like initialization functions, so int, uh, init header, uh, and it takes as its parameters uh, some types we don't know yet, but you know, struct header h, uh, sorry, star goes after header, uh, int, v1, double v2, struct thing, v3. What usually happens in this scenario is that h, as the first parameter, is the thing that is modified. Uh, and for add to point, it is usually the case that t1 is modified. This is not a firm rule. 
Uh, it is going to be something you will find examples that contradict this. Uh, sometimes a function changes all of the things you give it, uh, but usually if one thing is going to be changed, it is very likely the first one. Uh, yeah, that is just something to watch out for. Same is true uh, usually when we work with um, data structures. Uh, uh, data structure might have, you know, in push, uh, you know, stack push, we'll call it. All right, and the first thing that it takes is a pointer to the stack, uh, and then uh, in value. All right, it is the stack here, S, that is being modified by pushing the int pointer value onto it. Um, in the same vein, a lot of functions, and like the, the one uh, function definition I just wrote, stack push, has an integer return type. Uh, and this is not because you know, the result is, is being returned in that way. Stack S is being modified here, but what we're actually returning is a result code. Uh, and a result code tells us the outcome of whatever we just asked to do. So if everything went well, normally that is zero. If the return value is non-zero for some reason, that number can help you figure out what is wrong. So if you get back a return value of 36, you can look up in the documentation uh, and it will tell you, oh, uh, it returns 36 when the value for the third argument is too large. That could actually help you to track down uh, what has actually gone wrong. Uh, another thing that uh, runs in the same vein is the idea of error number. Uh, and there exists uh, this concept here uh, where in addition to a return value, there is a separate thing that tells you the error number uh, and it requires us to include this error number .h uh, file. Uh, and then we have to also declare extern int, I don't know, uh, or error number, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, and many functions and library calls set the value of this variable if something goes wrong during their execution. It gives you some additional information. Now, we declare it here as extern, meaning it's, it exists in another file, and we just want to be able to reference it within our own program. Uh, and the function documentation of some function will tell you that if an error occurs, it returns negative one uh, and sets the error number variable. Okay, and that's usually quite valuable in terms of actually uh, debugging your program. Uh, when you can see uh, when you can see the error number, you can also look inside the error number header, uh, and it contains definitions for various standard error values, uh, and those error values can be somewhat more helpful. Uh, if you just get back you know, 111, uh, if you go and look in the error number header, it might tell you connection refused is actually what the meaning of that is. Okay, right into the console. Uh, I already mentioned previously uh, printf here in this example, and I said we'd come back to it. Uh, the function formats a string and writes it to the console. Uh, and this was sort of going out of vogue for a while, but now seems to be coming back uh, in some languages. Uh, the idea that formatting uh, takes place, and uh, then that is what is written to the console. So the simplest possible case uh, is this printf statement where the only argument is the string to be printed uh, and it just writes to the console, hello world. Uh, if you want a new line, then you add backslash n at the end of this uh, and it's a new line character, which you probably need if you want your printout to look correct. Now, printf uh, does much more than this uh, and it also does formatted printing. So, if I uh, if I declare here uh, int is negative 25, I can then write it so that the value of z is this. Okay. Now, what I actually wrote is an explicit string that has a format specifier in it. Uh, and when I print that out to the console, it would print out the value of z is negative 25. Uh, and then there would be a new line character. Uh, in this example, the format specifier uh, percent %d is the same as percent %i. It means a signed integer. There are different format specifiers for different types. 
Uh, there are unsigned integers, floating point numbers, scientific notation. There's even one for a string. There's lots of options and you can specify your formatting a little bit if you want as well. Um, just be sure you chose the correct one. Uh, if you don't do this correctly, you get garbage. If the type that you are printing is a double and you use an int format specifier, it looks like the data is all trash because it goes to the memory that you specify it here with your arguments, Z, uh, and then tries to interpret that as the wrong type. Uh, and of course, the way that a double is stored looks nothing like the way an int is stored, so no wonder it doesn't do what you expect. Uh, and I really did help somebody debug this one time. They had uh, a printf statement uh, about some uh, some coordinates, uh, and the coordinates were all floating point uh, types, and they were trying to print them with the percent %d format specifier, and he, he didn't understand why they were garbage. Well, there you go. The uh, thing is that you can, uh, if you wish, put arbitrarily many format specifiers uh, in this uh, in this string, uh, and it will put as many uh, as many as you uh, put as many values as you specify. So you have to make sure that the number of format specifiers here in your string matches the number of arguments that follow from uh, follow from uh, your code. If you have three format specifiers and only two arguments, printf will just take whatever value is next on the stack, uh, and that might in fact actually be garbage, so you don't want that. Uh, and the printf routine takes an arbitrary number of parameters. So up in the first example, there are zero parameters. Here there is one. Uh, I could easily write a could easily write a printf that takes many more parameters. Uh, We'll say point T, uh, P2 dot X is a sign 1.5, P2 dot Y is a sign negative 3.3. Right, uh, and then I can print F here, percent F for a floating point. And all these specifiers are, uh, are quite easy to look up. There's uh, no need for me to uh, list you every single one. Uh, and then we could just put p2.x, p2.y, p2.z. And it takes as many parameters as are necessary as match the format specifier. And this will print out in parentheses 1.5 comma negative 3.3 comma 9.1. Okay. There are also in C the idea of precompiler define directives, and you will see some of these occasionally in example programs that we do. Uh, and you know, define buffer size 1000. Okay, uh, and then when you actually want to use that in some in some context, let's uh, just put it here in string stuff. All right, then you can say you know, char star buffer is assigned malloc buffer size. Now at compile time, the programmer uh, writes uh, this on a buffer size and the compiler goes through and replaces everywhere it finds this constant buffer size with the explicit value of 1000. If it's used in many places, uh, then it will save you from having to change it everywhere. You just change the define value up at the top uh, and that really can make life a lot easier. One of the things to watch out for though is the compiler is super literal about how it does this kind of thing. So if you did something like this, uh, two times 25 plus four, uh, as is returned in the value, um, then uh, you will get the wrong answer in a statement that looks like this. Uh, int is assigned value times two. Uh, and why is that the case? Why do you get the wrong answer? Well, the compiler, like I said, is super literal. So what it actually replaces that with, oh, I can just replace it here, uh, is instead of value, it's two times 25 plus four. Uh, and by the order of precedence, you get two times 25 plus four times two. So 58, that's not what you wanted. That's not what you wanted. So usually to avoid that, uh, using standard bed mass rules that I imagine you learned in elementary school, uh, when you define a value as a calculation, you should always put that in brackets. Then here the correct size is 
54, uh, and the substitution that the compiler makes looks like this, uh, and you get 54 times 2 equals 108, which is actually the value that you wanted, because bed mass. Okay, we've got all this time, and I haven't shown you how to write uh, main function. Uh, and main is where your program always begins execution, uh, and main uh, is always return type integer. Uh, the compiler will let you get away with void, but it should be return type integer. Uh, and char double star argv here as our second argument. Okay, the variable argc contains the count of the number of arguments to the program. So if our program is invoked like you know, dot slash uh, hello uh, with uh, arg1, arg2, and so on, the argc count for this will be three. So argc is always at least one. Uh, that is the uh, command that was invoked here uh, with uh, dot slash hello. Uh, and then any subsequent parameters are also counted in argc. argv uh, has two stars. What do you mean you can have two stars? Nobody can have two stars. No, what, what you're actually looking at is something that looks like this. It is char star and then star. It is an array of character arrays. Uh, that is to say it is an array of strings if it helps you to think about it. So the uh, array is of size argc uh, and then each element of that array is itself a string. So if I invoke the program uh, with you know, dot slash hello uh, and arg1 and arg2 then argc is 3. argv at index 0 uh, is going to be dot slash hello as, as a string. Uh, argv at 1 is arg1 and argv at index 2 is arg2. Uh, if I add a third argument, if I replace this argument here with say 17, uh, that, is, uh, that is the argv at, uh, at index 2 value is 17. However, uh, you can't do something like this because, well, argv at index 2 is a string. It is a character array. It is not an integer. If you actually want to convert it, we have to parse it to be an, uh, an int. And for that, there is this a2i function, if it helps you remember it, anything to int, uh, and that will attempt to parse the value. Uh, this will return 0 if it was unable to parse it. If it doesn't think it's actually a number, uh, then it will return 0. If it is like a mixed numbers and letters thing, it will just take the first numbers it can find and give up if it finds something that's not a number. Um, but then this is used to actually convert the value with a to i. Uh, it is convention that your uh, program returns 0 if everything went fine at the end of main uh, and return a non-zero number if something went wrong. Uh, this is usually helpful uh, when you are working on the command line. Uh, when you work on the command line, you can invoke a series of commands, so you can chain them together, uh, and the shell will only go on to the next command if the previous one was successful, and it judges success by what is the return value. If the return value is not zero, then it says it was unsuccessful, and that breaks the chain. So usually you should return zero if everything is okay. If the wrong number of uh, if the wrong number of arguments was provided, just as an example, then you would return uh, negative one as an example. If you return any negative number, uh, and that would indicate there was an error that had occurred. The last thing that I want to tell you about is the void pointer. Okay, um, it turns out we've already worked with a couple of them uh, in, in this situation. Uh, and malloc actually, if you look at the definition of it, has a return type of void star. Okay, um, a, a better example for where you might actually use a void star is here in stack push, uh, where if we're just storing a pointer here in the stack, maybe it doesn't matter what the type of that pointer is, and for that there is void star. It's not a pointer to nothing, it is a pointer with no type. It's just a pointer, uh, and we don't really know what the type is at the other end, and maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, memset 
is another example of something that takes a uh, that takes a void pointer as its first argument. Why? Because it doesn't matter uh, to Memset if this is an integer array or if this is an array of uh, characters or if it's an array of strings or if it's a pointer here to type uh, point. It doesn't matter. Uh, the function does not care what the type of the pointer that is provided is. All that we need to know is that it is a pointer. So you can use memset in this regard to initialize an array of ints, an array of char, an array of double, anything you like. This is a way of, uh, of saying we expect a pointer without knowing exactly what's going to be on the other side. This is just a few examples of where we are going to use untyped pointers. We're actually going to see uh, a lot more of them, in particular when we start working with threads uh, or when we start working with library functions where you get to choose what is the type of, uh, of data or you get to choose what is the uh, type of output then the authors of the library can't know in advance exactly what type you're going to use and in fact they probably even want you to define your own type and that being the case void pointer is a nice way of saying i need a pointer here but you choose what kind of pointer it actually is okay this has uh, gone on for at least a somewhat long time so i think we will wrap it up here i hope this has been helpful as a nice introduction to c as a language and to uh, some of the conventions that may be a little bit unfamiliar if you don't have previous experience in it uh, and if you really only have experience in c plus plus i hope this has highlighted some of the differences remember though that the best way to become familiar with the programming language is to actually write some programs using it um, but uh, feel free to refer back to this uh, anytime you have questions or if there's some syntax or convention that uh, doesn't make sense to you uh, in an example. All right. Thanks very much.